Set up for the Zoom folks at least. I hope this works. <laughs> My impression was the last one was not a question. You guys are about to see the screen up here, should be close to the blind. It's a little too dark in the room. Yeah, it's not that And then, uh, your you stay here until about the eighth of December. Uh, about the seventh. I'm leaving on seventh December seventh evening. And next up, yeah, uh, Poland. Oh, right. We can see There's a workshop on your continuously monitored quantum systems. <laughs> Very specific. Yes. <laughs> All the right people going, or uh, some? Well, I'm going, so they, they at least have one. <laughs> but they do have, yeah, some mostly Europeans, I would say, that they are interested in. You know, I think Klaus Momer is one of the organizing committee. And, uh, yeah, Europeans, people doing quantum metrology, and some some AMO. I think it's mostly theory. I don't know. I don't remember. I'm not sure they can watch them. They're not really good people in Poland. I've never been to a meeting there or visited one of the universities. Right, yeah. The workshop is at the University of Warsaw. So, yeah, they, they do have some other coming young people. I think they do have one AMO person. 
uh, yeah, or something. They, they done a lot of things, well, yeah, interesting things. Oh, also. Nice. Oh, transduction. Sure. That seems to be a big thing. Uh, quantum transduction that everyone seems to be doing. <laughs> oh, um, Con connecting optics with microwave. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Thanks again for coming up. Uh, this is the second in our series of talks by our spectrum this year, Mike uh, side. I just want to remind you all that he's here through December 7th, and you can find him on the eighth floor of the physics building if you want to chat about So, without further ado, we're going to go to that. Thank you. I hope uh, people can hear me uh, also on Zoom. Well, thanks again for allowing me this opportunity to give a talk. This one is going to be less impressive, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bit more theoretical, a bit more mathematical, but I think it's cute, it's interesting, it's also relevant to uh, what Ephraim's group is doing in terms of weak values. So I hope you, um, you enjoy this nonetheless. It's about generalizing the idea of conditional expectation for quantum mechanics. It's based mainly on these two papers. It's a very natural question to ask in the classical world, what is what happened in the past? Where did I put, put my keys? Where did I put my wallet? Important history questions important astronomy questions. It's natural to ask what happened. We never asked whether this question makes sense or not. It's natural that we assume that there is some objective truth that also happened in the past. Scientifically, we look at history, archeology, span astronomy. That's all we do, right, in, in these fields, what happened? In quantum mechanics, that question is a little bit more controversial. Do a double slit experiment. After you've seen the interference fringes, you ask which slit did the particle go through? You have an interferometer, which path did the particle take given some measurement results? That's called a which way question, or if you want to be fancy, you use German uh, virtual work, I think. So of course, Ephraim's group did some interesting experiments on this sort of problems based on weak value. But I have to say that it remains a very controversial topic because a lot of people still insist that it doesn't make sense at all to ask this question. John Goff, a mathematical physicist, very good at what he's doing in a recent paper, 2019, insists that it really doesn't make sense to ask this question which slit a particle went through in a two slit experiment if you have not measured it. So people take this narrow view that if you have measured, then it's okay to ask what happened. If you have not measured it, then you are not supposed to ask this question. And uh, he's very passionate about this issue. <laughs> Says that um, if you don't use exactly the way he prescribes, then you are in a state of sin. So, well, that's great because we now have a controversy. We have passionate people on both sides. That, that's nice debate. So what I'm going to do is not to use words of philosophy or you know uh, English to describe this problem. I'm going to show you mathematically. There's actually a mathematical formalism that is quite satisfying mathematically to describe how you would do retrodiction in quantum mechanics. I'll show you a lot of examples that go under this formalism, that this formalism is able to describe. Turns out that people, even in mathematical physics, have been studying this question. They just didn't realize that this is retrodiction. So a lot of examples by a lot of respectable people. I'm not saying that Ephraim is not respectable, but you know, a lot of people, a lot of people in quantum information theory and quantum foundations have asked this question and just 
mathematically. And finally, I will show you some neat applications in quantum sense. That's the main thing I'm going to talk about. That's the big picture. Well, we first need to look at what classical people are doing in classical statistics. So I'll just do a brief lecture of classical conditional expectation. That's the main way of doing retrodiction in classical statistics. We start with two random variables. One is hidden, x. One is observed, y. Assume that you are given two probability distributions. One is the prior. <clears throat> Assume that we know the prior distribution of this x random variable. So uh, we are doing Bayesian, OK? So assume that you x is random, and you know that a priori it has a certain probability distribution. Assume that given each value of x, we know the probability of y. So we know the conditional probability of y given any value of x. So this a distribution you would measure in your experiment. You do control, you control x, at the, you change x at each value, measure the probability of your observation. That's how you um, calibrate your experiment, right? Well, after we know these two probability distributions, there's a final unconditional probability distribution of your observation. Just take the two product between these two probabilities and then sum over x. Once we we have all these concepts, we can calculate the conditional probability of any random variable. There is a function of x. This a of x. I want to be general, so I'll assume that I want to calculate the conditional expectation of any function of x, multiply by the prior here, multiply by the conditional probability, sum over x, and then you have to normalize everything. So you divide it by the unconditional probability of y. This is the conditional expectation of a of x, some random variable that you don't know, conditioned on your experimental result, conditioned on what you have observed. Mathematically, you should notice that after I've done this conditional expectation, it's actually a function of my experimental data, your observation. So you should really think of this conditional expectation mathematically as a map from a function of x to a function of y. Okay, mathematically as a map. So we start with a of x. And after you've computed the conditional expectation, it's actually a function of y. So if you repeat your experiment, every time you see something different for your observation, your conditional expectation is actually a function of what you have observed in your experiment. So mathematically, it's a map. Once you've defined the conditional expectation, you can go backwards and calculate the base theorem. You can derive the base theorem. Just plug in a Kronecker delta here for my a of x. Imagine that it's just delta x x equal to some value, let's say u, then I get that base theorem, basically. If you've learned probability from your undergraduate, you know, what probability 101, they would start with base theorem and then calculate the conditional expectation. So that's okay. That's more intuitive. I just want to make the point that actually, if you go into more advanced probability theory, um, more mathematical probability theory using measure theory, for example, then actually mathematically, it's more convenient to introduce the conditional expectation first, and then introduce Bayes theorem, conditional probability theory, uh, conditional probability later. So you look at all the textbooks, there was the advanced probability theory textbook, they were Introduce conditional expectation first. So this is an example. Introduce conditional expectation first, and then introduce conditional probability. OK, so conditional expectation is a fundamental concept.
Now I want to talk a little bit more about the mathematical properties of these maps before we move to the quantum case. For convenience, let's assume that X happens before Y. Okay, so you observe some Y, X is some hidden truth, but let's say it happens sometimes in the past. Starting from the prior, if I want to calculate the unconditional probability distribution of your observation, again, I multiply with the conditional and then sum over X. I'll call this the Markov map. It maps some prior probability distribution to some final probability distribution of, of Y. I'm going to give this map a fancy symbol F. The first thing you can do is just do a predictive conditional expectation for random variables. I'm not doing retrodiction yet. I'm already given this conditional probability. So if I want to do a predictive conditional expectation, so let's say there is some random variable in the future, B of Y that I want to estimate. But of course, I'm not in the future yet. I want to predict maybe the stock market in the future. But all I can do is what I know at the present. So X happens before Y. So what I can do is do a predictive conditional expectation. Okay, so I'm already given this guy. So it's very easy to do. I just multiply it by B of Y. And then I get a function of X in terms of a random variable at present. Mathematically, this is what we call a pullback. There's a random variable in the future, stock market prices in the future. I don't know how to measure it at present. So I pull it back. I pull the random variable back through this con predictive conditional expectation to the present to a random variable that I can measure now or I can calculate now. So we call this a pullback. Mathematically, this is, if you think of this conditional probability distribution as a matrix, it's really just the transpose of it. And then we apply it to some random variable. The mathematically fancy way of describing this predictive conditional expectation is just some sort of adjoint. So don't worry too much about the mathematics. I'm just introducing all the jargons in the problem. So adjoint of the Markov map. So predictive conditional expectation is relatively easy to calculate. Retrodictive conditional expectation, that's the main topic of today. Some random variable in the past, I can no longer go back to the past to estimate it. I have some random variable in the future that I can use to estimate the past. This is retrodictive conditional expectation. The formula I just showed you before, mathematically, we call this a push forward. Again, there's a random variable in the past. I could not go back to the past to observe it directly. So I push it forward to the present times. This is now an a random variable I can, as a function of y that I can calculate. So re retrodictive conditional expectation is a push forward operation. For people who know category theory, this, they are, these are the jargons in category theory. But if you don't know category theory, it's perfectly fine. So why do we- It's confused because it looks backwards to, it looks like in the top one, you've come up with a way to calculate A of X. So I would have called that retrodictive. And on the second one, you're finding a way to calculate B of Y. I would have thought that was predictive. So I'm just somehow reading your equations backwards. Probably, yes. Let me explain this again. Y is something, okay, Y happens after X. So I, would have so I want to estimate this. Calculate B of Y. Right, is it equation for a formula for A? Uh, this is predictive. Right, so let's say there is a random variable as a function of y that I want to predict given x. Yeah. So I'd like a function that shows me what b of y is equal to. Uh, or approximately, I want to get close to b of y. Good. We read that equation as being the formula for a of x. That's right. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, probably. Uh, let's focus on retrodictive, right? Retrodictive. Same question. Right. So. <laughs> 
All right, let's start with predictive then. Y happens after X. This is the random variable we want to estimate. But I cannot measure it, right? Or I want to predict the future. All I have is X. I want to form a function of X such that I predict B of Y. So I calculate the predictive conditional expectation of something I cannot calculate in the future. But what I can do is I can average B of Y using this guy and sum over Y. Is this... I see. So even though you're calling this function A of X, it is the answer to this question about the expectation of B. Exactly. That, that's what okay. Right. So X is what you can measure, right? If you're trying to predict, X is the present random variable you can measure. And I now, based on X, I want a function of X that is the closest to B of Y. Right. Okay. That's a good question. Any other clarification? Because things are going to get more complicated. Yes, please. A and B here are kind of different. Yes, in general, A and B are random variables, and they can be any function. Are they independent? Are they independent? Uh, if you, in general, they can be, because I can use any method to predict the stock market, for example, right? But once I give you the map, once I tell you that I want to calculate the conditional expectation, <coughs> Then they are related by a map. No, I'm just doing inference. Okay, I'm just trying to guess. A of X. So X happens in the past. I want to estimate A as a function of X. A can be any function. So in principle, I can form any estimator of this random variable as a function of what I can measure now as a function of Y. But if I want to specify a specific estimator that is the conditional expectation, then I need to use this formula to propagate or pull back or push forward A of X to B here. Does it make sense? Please. No, what? Yes, yes. No, I'm given A of X, but I know the function of A, okay? But I don't know X. Does it make sense? So X is something I don't know, but A is a function of the unknown. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll give you an example. Where was Captain Kidd's treasure hidden? All I want to know is the location, but the location is a function of all the unknown variables that are involved in this problem, right? Could be, you know, what ship he used, which year he traveled, uh, all the other evidence in the past. So X is going to describe all the hidden variables that are relevant to the problem. But at the end of the day, we just want to know the position as a function of everything else. Okay, so A of X is still unknown, but the function as a function of uh, X is, is, is known. But then I can estimate it. So I'm not sure if that's the best example, but does this make sense, at, at least mathematically? So the point is that we very often, we don't want to estimate everything in the, in the world that is unknown. We just want to estimate some function of the unknown, okay? Okay, why do we care about conditional expectation? There's a very nice operational, almost engineering interpretation of the, of the conditional expectation. Let's look at parameter estimation in the Bayesian case, define the mean square error as the magnitude squared between the two. Again, remember A of X is what we want to estimate. B of Y is our estimator. Assume that they are complex, take the magnitude squared, take the expectation, 
over the joint probability. And we can calculate the joint probability using these two probability distributions, the prior and the conditional. There's the joint. There's mean square area in the context of Bayesian parameter estimation. One main reason why we care about the conditional expectation is that it turns out to be the optimal estimator, unique optimal or unique in, in some sense, um, practically unique estimator that minimizes the mean square error. So again, I want to estimate A of X. I want to minimize this mean square error. All I need to do in principle is to calculate this conditional expectation. Mathematically, it's also very convenient to abstract, to describe this theory in a very abstract way that is using the concept of Hubert spaces of random variables. So I have two random variables, both of them in terms of X. I can define an inner product between the two random variables, basically just some correlation between the two random variables by multiplying them both by the probability distribution of X and then sum over X. So it's an inner product, very similar to the inner product that you learn in quantum mechanics, but we want to weight it by the probability distribution. Okay, so let's do an inner product. So now any random variable as a function of X and Y in general lives in some very large Hubert space weighted by the joint probability distribution. If your random variable is a function of X only, this lives in a smaller Hubert space. If you have a random variable in terms of Y only, this lives in a smaller Hubert space. And each of these are actually smaller Hubert spaces of the larger Hubert space, okay? So mathematically, this turns out to be convenient. Why? You can turn this minimizing mean square error problem. Sorry, is there some question from the audience or no? Is there an audience to begin with? <laughs> On Zoom? No. Okay. No, okay. All right. So so no one on, on Zoom to begin with, right? Do, do we have people on Zoom to begin with? Because if there's none, then I can just ignore it. <laughs> well, it's still being recorded, but um, there's one. There are maybe two we have three in my house. Yeah, there's just right. So okay, all right, okay, great. All right, so so uh, it, it's nice to think about this in the Hubert space picture. Why is the conditional expectation uh, the the best estimator? So this is a of x. We think of this as a vector in some larger Hubert space. So some some vector. Remember, Hubert space is just a fancy way of describing right vectors. But I don't have access to x. I only have access to vectors in a smaller Hubert space as a function of Y only. So now given all these vectors in the smaller Hubert space, which one is the closest to this random variable or vector of interest? The answer, according to Hubert, which is just Pythagoras theorem, really, nothing fancy, is to say that I just take this vector, A of X, do an orthogonal projection into the smaller Hubert space. That's my, uh, my best estimator, the closest to the, uh, my closest vector in the smaller Hubert space to the random variable or vector of interest. The distance between the two vectors is precisely the mean square error or mean square root of the mean square error, right? We are doing mean square error. So distance is the square root of the mean square error. And if you do this projection, the distance is the minimum mean square error, okay? So that's what Hubert projection theorem says. The best vector in this small Hubert space of B to estimate A is simply the projection of A in the smaller Hubert space. And this is just a right triangle at the, at the end of the day. So you can look at the mean square area, you can break it down into two components. So this is just the length of A, 
This is just the length of the conditional uh, of the conditional expectation. And then you can rewrite the mean square error, square root of mean square error, as basically something like this. Why? Because it's a right triangle. They're just using Pythagoras theorem, fancy version of Pythagoras theorem. So mathematicians like to use this sort of projection picture as the definition of the conditional expectation for mathematically convenient reasons. That there's an operational meaning that, that that's the best approximation of A in some sense. And it turns out to be orthogonal projection. Okay, so that's quick introduction to classical yes. Uh, question, no. Now let's do Quantum. Before I move on to the quantum case, any question? Quick question. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, if uh, then you have perfect retrodiction, right? If the mean square error, I don't know the most general condition such that it's zero. I was thinking about it. Um, right, if you have no error, right? you're doing perfect prediction. I predict perfectly well exactly where, where, what, what happened in the past and this mean square error equals zero. So it depends on whether you are lucky enough that the data turns out to give you perfect information about X. That's a good question. Uh, any other question? Okay, quantum case. We want to do this in the most general way. How do you generalize a probability distribution? I hope you realize, I hope you, you, you have learned that the most general way of generalizing a probability distribution in quantum mechanics is to define a density operator. So now we have some quantum system that is generating random variables, but we need to use the density operator to, to generalize it. Okay, so let's say we have some prior density operator for some quantum system in the past. It's on some Hubert space, H1. How do you generalize the Markov map to the quantum mechanics, to quantum mechanics in the most general way? I hope you have learned in your open quantum system theory or quantum optics or quantum information theory, the most general way of generalizing the Markov map is a channel, quantum channel. Completely positive map, trace preserving. Still going to use the fancy F to describe it. So now the Markov map is propagating the density operator for some system in the past to some system in the future. Then you just apply this map, CP map, this channel to the prior probability or prior density operator to some, to another density operator, okay? So it doesn't have to live in the same Hilbert space anymore in general. That's how, that's the most general way of generalizing all the classics, classical stuff I've talked about so far. Imagine there's a hidden operator that generalizes the concept of a random variable. Could be Hermitian, it doesn't have to be. That happens in the past, okay? Some position of some particle in the past, for example, you know, photon number, but let's say this is a random variable that happened in the past. I cannot go back in the past. So I use a new observable. Again, nothing classical, no measurement yet. I ask the question, what is the best observable? Or what is the, just mathematically, what is the operator that would be the closest to the observable in the past? I'll call this the estimated observable. This is also an operator in general on, on the new Hubert space. If I want to find the estimated observable that is the closest to the hidden observable, that is basically a quantum version of retrodiction, right? Okay, so again, 
I do an experiment interferometer. Maybe the hidden observable is the path, position of the particle in the past. Now I ask, what should I measure at present that would give me the closest approximation to the position in the past? That is really, I would say, the most general version of quantum retrodiction. So we want to generalize everything we talked about so far in the classical regime to the quantum regime. The first thing we need to do is to generalize this weighted inner product that I defined earlier so that everything becomes simple. So again, just to remind you in the classical case, this is the inner product between two observables, two random variables, yes. Uh, because I can no longer go back into the past. I can only measure what I can measure now. So I'm actually have two different systems. You want to know the position of some electron. But to do that, you let it interact with something else. And you're going to measure something on the meter, try to figure out the position of the electron. What do you have to measure on your apparatus? What function do you have to measure? You would be in a situation where you have which you prepare the system where measuring the same observable now is actually not the best way to learn. Exactly. That's so another way. Exactly. The quantum system has changed, right? It has evolution, it has decoherence. The new observable that is the closest to the past may not be the same observable, even if they live on the same hyperspace. The EVM's example is more, uh, it's also a valid question that maybe I can no longer measure on the same hyperspace anymore. But in general, we, uh, right, they, they can be very different. Okay, thank you. So they don't, uh, one thing to emphasize is that the system in the past, lives on some hyperspace, the system uh, at present could live on some other hyperspace in general, just like Abraham said. Or, you know, there's some non-trivial dynamics as uh, Boris said, uh, that, that changes the system in a way that uh, your, your new observable that you should measure is, is not the, the same observable in the past anymore. Okay, I'll give you more examples later. But the first thing we need to do is to define a weighted inner product mathematically so that we can apply all the same mathematics that we use in the classical statistics uh, to the quantum case. Probably learn the concept of a Hubert Schmidt inner product between two op operators. Just do this, multiply the two operators, take the trace. This is an inner product, but this is not the right generalization, but because it doesn't involve the density operator. Remember in the classical case, we also need to involve the probability distribution somehow. So the most general way of defining this, if you go into Pat's book or Hayashi's book, is to uh, write it like this. So I have A here, two operators, A and C. I introduce a new concept that I call a density superoperator. It's a map. It's a superoperator. You apply it to an operator, it gives you another operator. It's not the density operator itself. It needs to depend on the density operator, but it doesn't have to be just a product. So the simplest case would be this guy, right? I just multiply the density operator on the left of A. This is my favorite version of the density superoperator. I do a symmetric <laughs> version on both sides and then take one half. That's called a Jordan product. Or in quantum information theory, people love this uh, root product. I take the square root of the density operator and put it on both sides of A. So now I have a mathematical way of generalizing the, yes. So this density superoperator needs to be case preserving or needs to be anything? Well, what I'm going to say to be true, it needs to have, that's a very good question. It needs to have certain nice properties. 
It doesn't have to be completely positive. It does need to be positive. And then there are a bunch of other properties that would be nice to have to ha give you a lot of nice results. But I don't have time to go through all the nice properties, but it doesn't have to be completely positive. It needs to be positive. Okay. So left, the first slide you mentioned, the left part isn't positive, right? It is positive. It just doesn't preserve emission operators. It is positive that you look at the inner product. <clears throat> this is always larger than or equal to zero. That's the for any A. This is the definition of of positive superoperator, right? Well, that's what we're we're not using this as a super operator in the familiar sense of propagating the system. No, 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 no. It's just mathematically a super operator. We are not using it to propagate. And a density matrix, I shouldn't necessarily think of this actually being the initial state of the system. It's just no, a anything, yes. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So if I know nothing, it would be the identity operator in the case. Okay, I'm just generalizing the inner product. I'll talk about generalizing the mean square error next. Here's the problem. In the classical case, we have a joint probability distribution between X and Y. Then I can just calculate the mean square error uh, by taking the expected value with respect to this guy. But in the quantum case, we know that there's no consistent or, or uh, conventional way of defining this for two observables that don't even live on the same Hilbert space, don't necessarily live on the Hilbert space. So what can we do about it? This is kind of the mathematical core of everything that follows. So we can still look at the classical mean square error and try to take inspiration about what we can do. Remember, recall that in the classical case, we take the difference between the two random variables first, take the magnitude squared, I can expand them into three terms like this. And then I take the expected value of everything. Expected value. The first term is a function of x only. I know how to do it. It's just the norm squared. It's just, just, the, just the inner product of a with itself in terms of px. This term, I know how to calculate the expected very, value very well. It's just in terms of py. The tricky part is the correlation between the two. So what I need to do is something like this, right? X, Y, P, X, Y, X, Y. I don't have this in the quantum case. That's a difficult problem, but, but I can break this guy into this thing. And then I sum over y first. After I've summed over y, it's going to be a function of x only. And then I can take the product with a and then take the inner product with px. So the mathematically fancy version of this guy is this. Everything is classical so far. A, again, remember, is a random variable in the past. This guy, remember, is the predictive conditional expectation or the pullback of B. So the point here, roughly speaking, is that, yes, B is in the future. It lives in somewhere else. But if I pull B back, now I can calculate the correlation between the two in terms of Px. So a little bit mathematical, please bear with me. I'll show you examples. Let's see how much time I have. Oh my goodness, my time is also almost over. Sorry, but yeah, but I just want to be, okay. Uh, let me see. So we just look at this expression and we ask, how do I generalize this to the quantum regime? All these concepts have quantum generalizations in the classic in the quantum case. It's just this F star that we don't really know how to generalize exactly. But if you stare at the formulas long enough, you realize that it's just what is called the Hubert-Schmidt adjoint of the channel. 
the easiest way of thinking about it is that if you think of the channel in terms of the cross representation like this, the Hubert Schmidt adjoint is just applying the Krauss representation, but in the opposite way. Okay. So this is how we can define the mean square error between two observables. Even though they live on different Hubert spaces, even though they happen at different times. So that's what I proposed in 2022. I call it divergence because I don't know what else to call it. Just think of it as a square distance. I have to go through this really quickly, but uh, I really want to go slow uh, because you know, it's, it's better to just tell you something that you understand. And... But anyway, so uh, you can name af name this after me. <laughs> you should, yes, because I proposed it and I think it's very nice. Anyway, so now we can define the generalized conditional expectation in quantum mechanics. So once you've fixed a density superoperator with nice properties, we define the generalized conditional expectation of the observable in the past. As the observable at present, that minimizes this divergence. I'm going to use F subscript star to denote it. So again, A is the observable I want to estimate in the past. I want to ask what is the observable I can measure now or some observable, some operator now that is closest to that observable in the past. <clears throat> this is what we mean by close. This is what we mean by distance or square distance. We look for everything, all the operators at present time that minimizes this mean square error. This is my generalized condition expectation, a complete analogy of the classical case. Explicitly, it's very easy to calculate. Just given by this guy, apply the superoperator, density superoperator in terms of the prior first, propagate the whole thing using the channel, and then take the inverse of the superoperator with respect to the final density operator. It looks a little bit complicated, but uh, let's look at the classical cases easier. There's my A, multiply. Do the density operator, super operator, with respect to row one. So Px is just, just my prior row, right? In the classical case, this whole thing is just propagating everything using the Markov map. And final thing, I take the inverse with respect to the super operator like this. Okay. So this is the definition I like because it's very operational. It tells me that I have a distance measure so that the conditional expectation is the best approximation according to this criterion. It gives you an explicit formula that is exactly the formula in Hayashi's book. It turns out that he also proposes this same formula in his book. He says that it is very convenient mathematically. A lot of special cases Weak value, um, they are all special cases. There is an alternative der derivation of this formula using what is called a quantum base rule. They have another way, some mathematical physicists have another way of deriving this formula using a very different uh, method that is called a quantum base rule. They published this very recently. It's related to this concept called a state over time by Robert Specken's group many years ago. Uh, this is also by, by their group. So all these things are connected, okay? In some mathematically satisfying way. I'll give you some examples. Start with the channel that is unitary, okay? You here, you dagger here. Go through the mathematics. What is the conditional expectation what is the best retrodiction that you should do at present to estimate something in the past? So A is here, U is here, U dagger here. It looks almost like the Heisenberg picture, but if you write down this formula in the quantum mechanics course, you get zero marks because it's not the Heisenberg picture, right? So if your professor asks you, 
write down the Heisenberg picture for, for this problem. It should be u dagger a, u, right? But you calculate the retrodiction and it turns out to uh, be applying the unit tree, but in the opposite direction. So it's not the Heisenberg picture, but you look at the literature of quantum information, quantum computing, you realize that people use this sort of representation a lot. It's basically this uh, something called Heisenberg representation, terrible name, but that's what they use. Heisenberg in quotes, Heisenberg representation of some observable. It turns out that the Heisenberg picture in the wrong way is still useful. They use this a lot in quantum computing. So this is for any nice density uh, superoperator. If I specify this superoperator using this root product, I calculate what is the conditional expectation is given by this formula. It's ugly, but, but that's what they propose. Again, mathematical physicists, Accardi and Cecchini back in 1982, that's what they proposed as one version of conditional expectation. This is very much related to what is called the PETS recovery map in, in quantum information. If you know what it is, it's it's great. If you don't know what it is, just know that very that is very useful in quantum information theory. People have done a lot of studies of this map uh, in quantum information theory for different purposes. You can think of this as a related concept to the generalized conditional expectation. Yet another example, this is a more operational example I want to give you. Think about a classical quantum channel now. So now this is a more special case. Initially, I have a classical random variable. This is not quantum anymore, just classical random variable. It's coupled to some quantum sensor. You want to do some measurement. There's the best estimation of the random variable A of X here. It turns out that if you assume your density superoperator to be the Jordan product, the mean square error of this problem is precisely the divergence between A and whatever observable that you measure at the end of the day. Okay, B is some observable you measure here. So imagine that B is an observable you measure here, just von Neumann projective measurement. And the optimal case, Turns out that Personnick, uh, some guy at MIT, proposed this 19, in 1971. He asked the question, if you have a random variable that is coupled to the quantum sensor, what is the optimal observable that you should measure here to minimize my mean square error? And it turns out to be exactly this conditional expectation that I defined. So this is a special, yet another useful special case of the general formalism that I described earlier. I think I'm running out of time. I'll just give you one example. I absolutely have no time to talk about the stuff that I actually want to talk about, but I think it's better to just give you some flavor of what we have here. Okay, so now this is the uh, yet another example, and this is what I think will interest uh, EFAM's group at least. We now look at the opposite case. Start with a quantum system but I do some kind of measurement. Then I get a measurement outcome. Of course, this is another special case of, an ex of a channel. It's a quantum classical channel, right? I start with a quantum system, do measurement, now I get a classical random variable. If I assume the superoperator to be the left product, the weak value, the complex version of the weak value. You frame this everything in a quantum case. You look at what is effectively the, the conditional expectation. That turns out to be exactly the weak value. Okay, it could be complex. If you choose the <clears throat> density superoperator to be to be the Jordan product version, is the real part of the weak value. Yes. So weak value involves uh, initial state and a final state. Yes. Where is the final state here? Initial state is just this row one, yeah. the prior. Final state, instead of doing a projective measurement in some projective basis, 
I'm generalizing this problem, assuming that there is a measurement with a POVM and it's conditioned on Y, measurement outcome Y here, and also the prior, okay? So you can think of it as post-selection given some Y, but in general, it's a function of Y, right? Every time you do an experiment, you don't need to throw out any data. The weak value is always defined. So it turns out that the weak value is a special case of the conditional expectation, depending on, uh, so, so again, a special, nice special case of the general formulas. Uh, many, many, many other examples. I just want to go through the rest very quickly. You don't have to understand the rest, uh, but, but I just go through this really quickly. I think this is getting a lot more complicated. I absolutely don't have time to explain this. So I'll just tell you that a lot of interesting applications in quantum metrology, at least theoretically. Now that we look at this conditional expectation, it has a lot of very nice mathematical properties that allow us to simplify problems in quantum sensing. I don't have time to talk about all these, sorry. Again, this is the, only the second time I give this talk, so. We can, for example, generalize this Rao Blackwell theorem. Just want to pay tribute to Rao, classical statistician, a legend, um, just died a few months ago, age 102. He did great things when he was 25. Kramer Rao Bound, Rao Blackwell theorem, and then he did a PhD with Fisher and then he didn't do much else. <laughs> but then you know he enjoyed the rest of his life as a legend until <laughs> one hundred and two. I think that's the best way, right? <laughs> okay, but then we can also using all these concepts, we can generalize the other. Th of course, we know quantum Kramer outbound and all that. We can generalize this other famous result uh, in the, into the quantum case using all these formulas, and that's the basic idea. In no time. Just talk about final one thing that is mathematically very satisfying. So far, I've been talking about retrodiction, right? Observable in the past, how do I do measure now to estimate the past? Let's talk about quantum prediction now. The reverse problem is, so now I'm going to fix B. Okay, now think of B as some observable in the future. What I can do measure now to predict something in the future. We can use exactly the same divergence that you should name after me. And now the, I ask the re reverse question, fix B and what is the A that, that minimizes the, the D? So what we found, what I found, is that there's a very simple formula for the prediction. It's really just this adjoint of the channel and that works for any nice, nice super operator. So the optimal predictor has a very simple formula. It's just the Hubert-Schmidt adjoint of the channel. A lot of examples, classical, I've shown you earlier. We already know this guy, it's just the adjoint of the Markov map. In the quantum case, if you have a quantum channel that is unitary, optimal predictor is U dagger BU. Now this is the Heisenberg picture, okay? So now it turns out that you can think of Heisenberg picture as optimal prediction. And it turns out that if you do this, the divergence is zero. This is the perfect prediction of the future if everything is unitary. So it comes back to your earlier question, what happened? Well, can you get zero, zero error? Well. In the unitary case, you can. Actually, the Heisenberg picture is the perfect prediction of the future. Generally, if you have Krauss, uh, Krauss representation of the channel is just the adjoint, it's just this guy. So a lot of nice mathematical properties that, that uh, you, can, you can write down formulas, rewrite the divergence in a more mathematically satisfying way that is time symmetric, so to speak. Optimal prediction, there's this nice formula. It looks like Pythagoras theorem. Same thing with retrodiction. It also looks like Pythagoras theorem and a lot of nice properties. Okay, I think I should conclude. 
conditional expectation is a retrodiction map for observables. Look into the literature. We have a unifying formalism now. And we find that in the literature, turns out that mathematical physicists have studied this problem in many different gu uh, guises, in many different ways. It's everywhere, actually. It's a mathematically respectable concept. Many people have studied this, you know, even Balavkin himself, uh, Gottsman, you know, Heronov, of course, just special case, Hayashi as well. Really nice mathematical properties, chain rule Pythagoras theorem, um, nice correspondence with prediction, and there are some neat applications in quantum sensing that I didn't talk about, but uh, neat nonetheless. These are the two papers that, that propose the, this nice formalism. The most recent one was uh, just published last week, I think, uh, in Quantum. Okay. All right, thank you so much for your attention. And do we have questions? Um, okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. When you, when you link the last, well, midway through, you sort of brought up the issue of using a Jordan product and how that um, sort of gives us the connection to the Wigner function. So I was thinking just based off another talk, which I heard last week, how does that all tie together with, um, let me think, how am I going to phrase this in a way which makes easy sense for everyone. I can rephrase your question. I think, is there any way to connect this to quasi-probability? Yes, quasi-probabilities. And the carryover, because of the Leifert speckens result with quantum Bayes theorem, you have some badly behaved conditional probabilities. So does that negativity in the conditional probabilities carry over to this formalism, which you've presented as well? Probably, yes. Because if you look at the state over time formalism, which is kind of, has very close connection to this, so uh, very often this state over time may not be positive. Right. So that is really something you cannot avoid in this formalism. So it really just comes, it seems that it ties to the fact that we're trying to enforce a form of a joint distribution exactly. on non-complementary yes. observables. And that just says that, well, quasi-probabilities are really what we should be working with or thinking about in yep. the most general way. Excellent, yes. Okay. Uh, Right, again, this ties back to, to the problem that you cannot define a joint yeah. probability distribution in quantum. Yeah. You can't, so for these people, they, uh, you know, Speckens and other people, they try to define a density operator that works as a, an exact analogy of this guy. Yeah. So it's possible, but then it has to go next. Uh, it doesn't stay positive in a, right. a lot of special problems. Okay. But then whether there's another, connection to quasi probability representations. This is this connection between Jordan product, conditional expectation and weakness representations is the only one I can find so far. So it could be interesting to look at more special cases. Thank you. Other questions? I have a kind of simple or naive one. Um, when you have a unitary map, of course, you can just take the adjoint and you have 100% predictive or retrodictive power. When it's non-unitary, you just took the adjoint of each term and the cross operator sum, but that's not unique. So that expression works for any decomposition into cross operators? Excellent question. Um, the decomposition is not unique, but the adjoint is unique. Okay. So you can use any I think decomposition. My favorite decomposition that still works. Gives you the same thing. Okay. It's interesting. The map is But it's just... not really reversing the map, of course. You don't no, no, undo no, no, the no, decoherence. No. You just redo more of it in the other direction in some sense. I would like to think of it as as prediction or retrodiction. Okay. Right. For for observables. So But you, you don't get a vanishing mean squared error, I guess, is the simple way to put it. I mean it, exactly. You it, it's always worse, right? There, there if you do everything 
assuming a nice density super operator, there's always some ad added error. The error is always non-negative. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yep. What is the significance of the ambiguity in the definition of the super operator? Because um, I imagine there's an infinite number of possible definitions. Yes, there is. So it uh, usually you look at different applications, it turns out that it's a pretty good choice for each application. So the analogy I would like to make is again with quasi-probability representations that for a density operator, there can be a lot of different quasi-probability rep representations mm. that people pick one depending on the application. So it's true that we have many different versions, but again, for different applications, we we should pick different uh, super operators that suits your application. But as with the quasi probability distributions, every definition you used was linear in the operator and in in row. It was just an ordering choice or the square roots. Uh -huh. But you kind of just put that in by hand here. Would there be any meaning to taking something that wasn't linear, taking some higher order? Oh, that's a very good question. But I get. But there was a square root on each side, right? Or, or did I remember it's, it wrong? Uh, it's linear with respect to the observable you're applying it to. Well, and we, also we, in some sense, first order in row is my point. Um, first order in row, this one is not first order in row, right? Um, <laughs> if they were numbers, it would be. So <laughs> you, you can define things in more, uh, in fancier ways, you know, row raised to a power of you know, one third or something. So there are many different ways to describe how this guy depends on rho. It needs to be linear with respect to A, because otherwise this is not an inner product. Okay, sure. We need it to be inner product so that it has all the nice rest of the nice properties that we can do. But in, with respect to rho, there are many different fancy ways you can define it. Okay. Anything else? If not, let's thank Monkey again. So this is very theoretical. I'm sorry about this. There, there are applications. I just don't have time to talk about it. The next talk will have a little, much more experimental relevance. Hopefully.